Okay, so good afternoon. This is our last lecture. And uh, I want to start out with uh, uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, the, um, the microbes in the gastrointestinal tract again. I, I, I just uh, want to uh, give you a better appreciation for uh, the, the immensity of uh, the uh, uh, microbes in the gastrointestinal tract and their potential for letting us uh, uh, learn a lot more about uh, disease and health in the future. And a lot of this started uh, uh, about in the late, late 1980s when uh, uh, this uh, project called the Human Genome Project was started. And uh, the several governments uh, started to put a lot of money into uh, trying to find out what the uh, uh, human genome looked like, what the sequence of our genome looked like, the adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine sequence. And so uh, over a period of about 13 years and $3 billion, at least in the United States, $3 billion, over $3 billion, and a combination of competition from the public sector and the private sector Finally, in uh, the 2003, these two papers were published, one from the private sector, one from the public sector, showing the, a, the uh, sequence of human DNA. And uh, with this, there, there was a lot of uh, uh, really interesting work that developed. And uh, as I said, it took over $3 billion to develop this in 13 years. Now, if uh, one of us wanted to go to a specialized laboratory and ha have our human genome sequenced, our individual human genome sequenced, it would probably cost somewhere between eight to ten thousand uh, dollars, and uh, it would take uh, several weeks to, to get the results back. Now, it's looking like uh, using some new techniques. This nanopore technology. Uh, uh, this is just. Uh, uh, an article from The Economist, okay, uh, using nanopore technology, they're projecting that within the next few years, we will be able to get our genome sequenced within 15 minutes, and it will cost less than $1,000. So from $3.3 .3 billion in 13 years to $1,000 in 15 minutes, I think that there's a lot of uh, technology development that has occurred. So <laughs> how safe is it? <laughs> well, I, I think that there are some real ethical considerations about uh, having one's genome sequence. Now, I think that uh, uh, how that's used by insurance companies, et cetera, I think that that's a, uh, that's a big issue. But from the technological standpoint, I think that uh, uh, that's, uh, it's very exciting to have developed all these things. And along with that, uh, these technologies have been applied to uh, uh, the human uh, microbiome, the microbes that live within our bodies. And there are various uh, niches in our microbiome. One is in our mouth. Uh, we have the nasal microbiome, the skin microbiome, the gastrointestinal microbiome, various areas that now are becoming very interesting. And they're all a little bit different, but uh, a lot of Funding is now being placed into this new roadmap, and worldwide, I think that uh, there's a lot of excitement that uh, we might be able to discover uh, new aspects of health and disease using this uh, uh, human microbiome. And this is just what I've showed you before. With these new techniques, we are now able to uh, 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 evaluate microbes that we have never been able to evaluate before in the gastrointestinal tract. Well, in the past, we used to think of the microbes in our gastrointestinal tract as either the ugly or the bad, okay, because microbes are thought to be pathogenic. But I think we're beginning to get more and more of an appreciation that these microbes are actually like another organ in our body and actually an essential organ in our body because they promote our health. These are some of the aspects of health and disease that these microbes are involved in. Nutrient metabolism, <coughs> tissue development, development of innate and adaptive immunity, resistance to colonization with pathogens, maintenance of intestinal homeostasis. I've mentioned these things before, but I, I'd like to just give you a little bit more of an in-depth appreciation for what happens when there are no microbes 
in the gastrointestinal tract. This is work that was done at Washington University by Dr. Jeff Gordon's group and reported in PNAS in 2002. And what they did in this study was they took baby mice and raised them in a germ-free environment and compared the, uh, the development of the gastrointestinal tract in those baby animals that were raised in a germ-free environment versus a conventional environment. Here's a picture of the intestinal villus, normal intestinal villus, at 14 days. Here's a picture of a normal intestinal villus at 28 days. And these were specially stained so that you could see the capillaries in the villus. Here you can see very little villus development at 14 days. Here's a lot more villus development at 28 days. That's just normal development. Now what happens when you raise these animals in a germ-free environment? No microbes, very sterile environment. Here is a villus at 40 days after birth in animals raised in a germ-free environment. GF is germ-free environment. Here are animals that are also 40 days old, raised in a germ-free environment for 30 days, then taken out of that germ-free environment and placed with conventional microbes, just put into a regular cage for 10 more days. You can see a marked increase in the uh, villus capillary growth. And here is also a 40-day-old villus. Uh, and these animals were placed in germ-free environment for 30 days and then exposed to only one type of microbe. The type of microbe we see here is Bacteroides theta iota omicron, a lot of Greek. <laughs> uh, but for 10 days, exposed to only one microbe, that microbe induce the development. But if those germ-free animals that were raised in a germ-free environment for 30 days and then placed with just E. coli, that did not develop. Those looked more like these villi. So that's telling us that it depends on the microbe that these animals are exposed to. So if they're only exposed to one microbe, that may not be necessarily a microbe that stimulates the development of the gastrointestinal tract. But here we see mixed microbes stimulating development of the GI tract, okay? And this is a picture that I showed you before, and I, I went through the, uh, 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 the difference in the upper gastrointestinal tract and the lower gastrointestinal tract, a lot of difference in the number of microbes in the upper versus the lower gastrointestinal tract. And I said before a little bit about the differences in the major roles. And one of the roles was what I called a bioreactor role. This animal is a termite, okay? Termites can eat wood, and they can digest wood. And the reason they can eat and digest wood is because they have these enzymes in their gastrointestinal tract called lignases. We do not have lignases in our gastrointestinal tract. But we do have bacteria that can help us digest certain complex carbohydrates. Maybe not as complex as wood, but certainly we have these uh, 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 microbes in our gastrointestinal tract that can help us digest certain kinds of carbohydrates. And now studies are being done that look at our efficiency to digest carbohydrates and the types of microbes that are present in our gastrointestinal tract. And it's being found that the type of microbes that are found in our gastrointestinal tract may relate to obesity versus thinness. This would be a phenotype where we have very efficient microbes in our gastrointestinal tract, okay? Obviously, that's not all of the uh, problem of obesity, but this, is, this can be a part of it, and there are a lot of papers uh, that are coming out to discuss the types of microbes that might be related to obesity. The other major category of function is the immune function of the microbes in the GI tract. And this is a picture from a paper that was published in the 1960s, 1963, from a group at the University of Chicago 
uh, headed by Dr. Hans Popper, a very famous uh, uh, a, uh, pathologist. And they raised baby mice in a germ-free environment versus a conventional environment, and they looked at the axillary lymph nodes in the germ-free environment and in the conventional environment. And you can see that those raised in the germ-free environment had much smaller lymph nodes, and their germinal matrices were also much smaller. So it takes microbes to stimulate development of the immune system. So if you want to do studies on the uh, uh, intestinal microbiota, you have to be able to handle a lot of diapers and collect stools from a lot of diapers. And you also have to have a lot of freezer space. And in fact, uh, when we first started our studies, we had one freezer. And we had to apply to the National Institutes of Health to give us another freezer. And that one is full now, too. So uh, this is a, a, a real issue that you, know, you have to have uh, a, a sample storage space for, for doing studies. And this is the, the, the situation with all places that are doing these studies. Now, I want to just go through. Uh, some of the studies that we have available to us that look at development of the microbes in the gastrointestinal tract using non-culture-based techniques. And I want to first preface this with saying that there are now several different types of techniques that are being used to evaluate microbes using DNA-based technology, and a lot of these are different, and we are in the process of trying to standardize and determine which are the most accurate, best ways to do this. This is one study that was done at Stanford University, where they looked at 14 healthy full-term infants beginning with the first stool after birth, and they continued at defined intervals throughout the first year, and they used a technique called small ribosomal subunit uh, uh, RNA uh, sequencing, okay? And that involves using certain uh, DNA primers to uh, uh, select out a whole bunch of uh, microbial genes, and uh, 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 it's, uh, it's not as um, comprehensive as some of the uh, 454, some of the more uh, technologically advanced sequencing techniques that we have available to us. But this was one of the first studies that, uh, that looked at this. Very busy looking slide. but. These are representations of all of these individual babies. And I just want to point a couple things out to you with some of these babies. Over here, we see that uh, uh, there's uh, uh, this usually an increase, okay, and then a stabilization of what's called the, uh, or the uh, uh, number of microbes. Uh, and here we see some interesting findings with these uh, arrows. These arrows are dips, decreases in the microbes. What do you think happened at that time? Use of antibiotics, exactly, okay? So that's when antibiotics were being used in these babies. Now, what are we seeing here? Here we see a baby right at the very beginning who had microbial DNA, right at the very beginning who had microbial DNA. Same thing over here. We see several babies right at the very beginning that had microbial DNA. We're told, we are told that the meconium is sterile and meconium is not supposed to contain microbes. This is the first stool, this is meconium and you're seeing microbial DNA. Okay, so this is one study that is showing microbial DNA. No, 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 no. These were healthy term babies. At the time of birth, they were healthy term babies. Okay, and then here's another study. Yes? But, uh, they are colonized uh, from the vagina. Uh, okay, now, these are cult uh, non culture based techniques, and you are not measuring live microorganisms, you're measuring dead microorganisms. Some of those babies were born by cesarean section. Okay, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, okay? Now, here's another study, and this is a very interesting study. Uh, PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is one of the most prestigious journals in the world, okay? 
And usually we think that we have to have hundreds of patients or you know, numerous subjects in a study to be able to uh, 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 even think of publishing a paper in this kind of a uh, very prestigious journal. Well, the authors here published this paper with an N of one, one subject. And it's probably, that one subject was probably the baby of one of the authors. And I say that it's probably with the baby of one of the authors because you had to have access, very close access, to this one individual. Because what they did in this study, they studied one term healthy baby over 2.5 years. And they collected stool samples starting from the very beginning throughout these first two and a half years. And they did sequencing studies. So there's a couple interesting things. Here we see the diversity, number of you know, diversity of the microbes, and it increases over time in this baby. There's a couple of other very interesting points here. This is the mother's stool, and we see the diversity up here. So this is an adult diversity. Uh, this is the, the, the mother's microbiota up here. This is the baby's meconium. What do we see? Microbial DNA. There, is, there are microbes in that meconium. There are traces of microbes in that meconium. This trend line would have gone up a little bit higher, but at this point, right around 244 days, the baby was treated with antibiotics, and that brought the line down a little bit. And over here, the baby received a second course of antibiotics. Okay, We see that there was actually quite a marked uh, decrease over here in the uh, uh, diversity of the microbes. Okay? So this is one of the first studies, very longitudinal studies of uh, uh, the microbes in a, the GI tract. Now this, again, looks like a very busy slide, and it's the same baby, and uh, they're doing sequencing, and they look at the phyla. Remember I said with the taxonomy, you can look at the phylum, uh, family, class, order, genus, species. Well, here they're looking at the phylum. Each one of these has different colors. And I want you to focus down here and down here. Here's some colors. We see almost all blue, OK? That's the firmicutes. So we have one phylum for quite a period of time. And then over here, we have the baby going to a different kind of a diet with rice cereal. We start seeing some more different colors. Here we see table foods, more different colors. So you start seeing a diversity of these phyla develop in the gastrointestinal tract with the introduction of different kinds of foods. Then they did even a more expensive, uh, more uh, sophisticated study looking at metagenomics, physiologic, functional meta, uh, metagenomics. And the way this is done, you look at the sequence uh, of the entire microbial group, you put that into a computer, and uh, that computer will tell you a little bit about the physiology and the, uh, uh, the function, the, the, the metabolism of those particular microbes. And so, they did this with 12 of their samples from this uh, one baby. The earliest microbiome, day three, was enriched in genes facilitating lactose uptake and utilization. That makes sense, because what is the primary sugar in mother's milk or in milk that the baby? Lactose, OK? They also saw at day six vitamin synthesis genes that were present. Then they saw more complex carbohydrate degrading genes coinciding with the time of pre-weaning. This is the time when the baby was coming off of the mother's milk and going on to different kinds of uh, foods. And the adult microbiome was present by about day 400. Okay, So this is the emergence of the microbiome in this one baby. And you can see where this is actually a very important study being done on only one subject. Now, with this... Uh, uh, what we're finding with the uh, uh, meconium, we're beginning to think that there might be something called a fetal microbiome. This is what we were talking about before. 
the mammalian fetal intestine is essentially sterile, and the first exposure to maternal microbiota occurs during passage through the birth canal during the first hours after delivery. Okay, that is what we think is the dogma, common knowledge. Okay, but some of the data that I showed you from uh, a couple of the studies now does not so seem to uh, uh, be the case. You've seen this picture before. These are microbes in the vagina, and they migrate up and go around the uh, chorioamniotic membranes. And here we see a, uh, the blow up of the chorioamniotic membranes, and some of these microbes can translocate into the amniotic fluid. Well, what is that fetus doing? That fetus is swallowing the amniotic fluid. Okay. Work that was done by a colleague by the name of Dr. Roberto Romero uh, is very interesting in this regard. He's been looking at uh, uh, the vaginal microflora and inflammation as a precursor to premature labor. And recent studies that he has done looking at amniotic fluid samples, and uh, Dr. Romero has uh, uh, a lot of uh, samples, saved samples in his uh, laboratory uh, in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and uh, uh, they've been looking at culture-based and non-culture-based techniques to evaluate the microbes in amniotic fluid. So he has these, uh, these amniotic fluids from mothers who deliver at various gestational ages. Here is a little bit of his work looking at bacterial DNA. This is bacterial DNA, gene copies. As you go along here, you have more bacterial DNA. As you go up here, you have gestational age at delivery. With very little bacterial DNA, the babies are close to term. With more bacterial DNA, the babies are more preterm. So that's telling us that there are microbes in the amniotic fluid that seem to relate to the development of prematurity. They also did studies looking at the amniotic fluid from this stage and compared it to amniotic fluid from this stage. Here they found more IL-6 and white blood cells. Here less IL-6 and white blood cells, suggesting more in, of an inflammatory response down here. That inflammatory response is thought to be something that initiates premature labor. Okay, now back to the uh, uh, meconium. Amniotic fluid is not that easy to obtain. In fact, uh, most mothers will not uh, say, you can stick my amniotic fluid uh, uh, to get some uh, amniotic fluid uh, just for your studies. That, that, that just will, is not happening these days, okay? Uh, I think that this is very, very difficult to get. So uh, could we potentially be using the uh, meconium from these babies as a reflection of what went on in utero? Well, this is work that uh, did with uh, uh, actually a visiting scholar, uh, Maka Meshvaldadze, who uh, uh, worked with us from, uh, she's from Georgia, Tbilisi, Georgia, and uh, she I met her at a uh, Hippocrates conference about four years ago, and uh, she ended up uh, getting a European Society for Pediatric Research scholarship and came to work with us for, it was only supposed to be one year, but then they got into a war uh, with Russia and uh, it was very dangerous, and so she decided to stay for another year. So she got a lot of uh, very good work done, and so she worked with us on this project. And uh, this is the uh, meconium. Uh, looking at uh, various samples of uh, various outcomes in the meconium. This is maternal antibiotic treatment, okay? And here we see diversity. If the mother was treated with uh, antibiotics, there was a lower diversity than if the mother was not treated with antibiotics. This is very interesting. Greater than 30 weeks gestational age, greater diversity than less than 30 weeks gestational age. This one here is very confusing. Breast milk versus formula, okay? Now, you're thinking, probably if you're very alert, you're probably thinking that 
This is meconium. And most of these preterm babies, these are babies less than 1,250 grams, have probably not even be, been fed yet. Okay? Well, that's the case. Most of these babies have not even been fed yet. But this is the mother's intent, what they wanted. They wanted to feed breast milk versus formula. At least in the US, one of the things that we see is that those mothers who intend to breastfeed tend to be higher socioeconomic class than those mothers who tend to formula feed. I think that that's very common in many of our hospitals, certainly is very common in our hospital. And there have been studies that have looked at uh, the microbial ecology, vaginal microbial ecology, and also development of premature labor related to the vaginal microbial ecology and uh, uh, the uh, socioeconomic status. So we're conjecturing that this might be one of the reasons. But again, this was a very interesting finding here, very uh, statistically significant. It might be just a total nothing, but uh, uh, we did see this uh, very interesting statistical <laughs> difference. Okay, so it may be that in the future we can use meconium as a material rather than use amniotic fluid uh, to study what is going on in utero. And the point there is that uh, 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 it is possible that the different microbes in the G in, that, that are present in the amniotic fluid could stimulate the fetal gastrointestinal tract. The gastrointestinal tract is the motor that drives systemic inflammation. Do you remember that? It's something that we've uh, said before that that inflammatory response could actually be coming from the mother rather than the fetal membranes. And I think that it's still not clear whether the inflammation that induces preterm labor comes from the mother or the fetus. Okay, another question. We were talking about C-section versus vaginal delivery. And in different places, you have different uh, uh, percentages of C-section. I was told yesterday that the C-section rate in uh, uh, Greece is uh, somewhere between 40 to 50 percent. Is that is, that's about right? Uh, in the U.S., it's somewhere between 30 to 35 percent. And I've been to other countries. Uh, 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 for example, in China, it's now 60 to 70 percent. And in some of the countries in South America, uh, it's uh, getting to be uh, 90 to yeah, uh, close to 90 percent. In private hospitals, they rarely see uh, a, a vaginal delivery anymore. So the question arises, is it possible that there could be some problems that could be associated with the differential microbiota that these babies get from mothers who, are, uh, who deliver their babies by C-section versus vaginal delivery? Okay, so here's a schema that we have. Uh, this is vaginal delivery, where the babies get exposed to the vaginal microflora, and the hypothesis is that with normal microbial seeding, you have normal development of immunity. That's the hypothesis. And with C-section delivery, you have a lack of exposure to the vaginal microflora, abnormal microbial seeding of the GI tract, and abnormal development of immunity. There was a paper that came out in PNAS about a year ago that looked at this. This is a paper that came out of Venezuela looking at uh, babies whose mothers delivered by, uh, uh, were delivered by C-section versus vaginal delivery. And they did something called a principal component analysis. And this is somewhat complex, but I, I just want you to look here at the colors here and the region of this map here and the colors are what uh, we want to relate to one another, okay? So here is the mother's uh, body habitat. The, the green is the oral mucosa. The red is the vagina. The blue is the skin, the mother's skin. Here, the baby's delivery mode, vaginal delivery versus C-section delivery, okay? Vaginal delivery, we see them over here looking a lot like the mother's vaginal microflora. Cesarean section delivery, blue and light blue, looking a lot like the mother's skin. So that is telling us that there's a difference in the kind of microbes that develop in these babies' gastrointestinal tract if they are delivered by C-section versus vaginal delivery. We do have some other studies 
maybe not such great studies, that are, but these are culture-based studies, studies that looked at uh, children at seven years of age who were C-section delivered versus vaginally delivered. Okay, I want you to just look at this top line over here, clostridia. There's a significant difference at seven years of age in babies who were C-section delivered versus vaginally delivered. Work that we're doing, um, I have this uh, uh, collaboration with a couple of very good microbial ecologists, and uh, this is uh, uh, our chairman of uh, microbiology that I'm working with, and uh, we have been able to collect some of our uh, stool samples from babies uh, who are delivered by C-section versus vaginal delivery, and these are the phyla, some of the major phyla, and this is week one vaginal versus C-section delivery, and we see that there are some differences in some of these uh, phyla of bacteria. But on week four, we are not seeing any significant differences in the phylum. But then when we dig deeper, when we do deeper sequencing, looking at just these firmicutes over here and looking at uh, one species, the Enterococcus, at four weeks, we are seeing differences. So there are some differences between C-section versus vaginal delivery, but you have to dig deep to find them. Does that matter if you have different microbes? Well, I had the opportunity to work with one of our fetal maternal uh, postdoctoral fellows, and we wrote this paper in Clinics and Perinatology. It's, it's now published, uh, just uh, uh, Clinics and Perinatology uh, about six months ago. And if you look at cesarean section uh, delivery versus associated childhood diseases, and that's what uh, 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 Dr. Rushing did here, uh, she found papers looking at the differences between C-section versus vaginal delivery and the subsequent development of disease. Here we see asthma, celiac disease, diabetes mellitus, gastroenteritis, gastroenteritis and asthma, all with an odds ratio that is greater with C-section delivery. So is it possible that the microbiota, the development of the microbiota with C-section versus vaginal delivery is causing this? I don't think we can say that yet, but I think it's a very interesting relationship. What about the microbiota in the intestinal tract of preterm babies? Well, we're actually doing this also, uh, looking at uh, the longitudinal development, but this is a study that came uh, out of Lyon, France, and was uh, uh, published in the Journal of Pediatrics just this past year. And they uh, did actually not a full sequencing technique. They, they did what's called a, a gel electrophoresis, and they took some of the, uh, the bands and sequenced some of the bands. And they looked at uh, uh, just certain bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract using uh, some of these uh, um, uh, bacterial probes, DNA probes. And here you see over a period of time, these are the different uh, uh, species of bacteria. But the one thing that's so interesting is Staphylococcus species is the highest. Over time, Staphylococcus species is much higher than all of these other species. What is our major cause of hospital-acquired late-onset sepsis in prematures? Late-onset. Uh, Gram-negative or gram-positive? Gram-positive. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think Staphylococcus accounts 50, 60 percent. Yeah, and the others are, uh, uh, and they're usually uh, uh, coagulase negative staph, right? Yeah. And the others are uh, uh, sort of a combination of other microbes, okay? But this seems to fit, doesn't it? Here is a graph of babies with feeding problems versus no feeding problems. You can see that a lot of the microbes here are depressed, but what's still really high? The staph still very high. Just an interesting phenomenon. Okay. This is a mouse who's running away from a cat. And um, sometimes a mouse has to be very clever to be able to get away from the cat. And uh, uh, the microbes in our GI tract may actually 
make a difference in how clever we are and how smart we are and what our behavior is later on in time. I think that there's some very interesting studies that are coming out, but most of these studies are now in mice. They're, they're, they're not in, uh, in humans yet. But this is a very interesting paper that came out of PNAS just uh, a couple months ago. And what they did in this paper, they looked at germ-free animals versus specific pathogen-free, okay? These are animals that are actually allowed to be in a uh, uh, open, regular cage environment, okay? And they looked at how these animals traveled, okay? And you see over a period of time that uh, uh, animals traveled a lot more if they were germ-free. Now, I'm not a, uh, a mouse psychologist, but this paper talked about having differences in anxiety levels. These mice who were raised in a germ-free environment when they were adults had a different anxiety level than those animals who were raised in a regular, conventional, specific pathogen-free environment. They also did some studies, and I'm not going to get into the uh, uh, specific aspects of this, where they took the germ-free animals and gave them microbes, conventional microbes, shortly after birth, and found that uh, those animals had a normal behavioral activity when they got to be adults. But then when they tried to do the same thing when these animals were young adults, rather than to give them the uh, uh, microbial transplant uh, very early on, they found that those animals still had their major anxiety problems. So they developed this. This is a, uh, a very interesting review of this, uh, of this work that I refer you to, looking at uh, the fact that there seems to be a critical period with the development of microbiota that actually may affect behavior and development later on. Okay, now, over the last 50 years, a lot of things have happened in our environment. And we've been using a lot more antibiotics over the last 50 years, and uh, immunizations have developed. And uh, uh, along with some of these changes that have occurred over the last 50 years. We're starting to use more antibiotics in agriculture, et cetera. With these changes that have occurred over the last 50 years, we're starting to see changes in several diseases, such as measles, mumps, TB, hepatitis. But at the same time, over these last 50 years, we're seeing an increase in multiple sclerosis, type 2 diabetes, Crohn's disease, and asthma. This is work done by Jean-Francois Bach from Paris. And in his paper in the New England Journal, he also did something very interesting where he looked at countries in Europe that were either wealthy countries or relatively poor countries. So with a, a gross national product per capita, which is large versus small, he looked at the prevalence of multiple sclerosis. The rich countries had more multiple sclerosis. The rich countries had more childhood diabetes. The rich countries had more asthma. Could this be because the rich countries seem to have more hygienic conditions? Is this part of the hygiene hypothesis? Is there less exposure to microbes and antigens early on? Are we not allowing our kids to have enough exposure to some of these uh, uh, agents? This is uh, a paper that just came out about a year ago using uh, non-culture-based uh, technology and this principal component analysis technique to look at different countries in Europe. Here's Germany, here's Scotland, uh, here's Spain, here's Italy, here's Stockholm. And each, the, each these colors represent uh, a, a set of microbes. And you see that, for example, over here in Stockholm, there's a clustering in this region. You see more of a clustering over here in Italy more of a clustering over here in Grenada. So different countries seem to have a slightly different microbiota. Could this be why, if you look at Finland and if you look at Estonia, and there's just a little bit of sea between them, but genetically the people in Finland and Estonia are very similar, right? Could that be 
that Finland has been able to become more wealthy over a period of time compared to uh, uh, Estonia over a period of time. And with that uh, has uh, 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 more hygienic conditions. What do we see in, uh, in Finland? M massive, massive increase in what? Type 1 diabetes. They're not seeing that in Estonia. Okay, so very interesting finding. Okay, so the title of this talk was Probiotics and Prebiotics. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background in the microecology of the GI tract, but uh, the question that's frequently raised is should we be using probiotics in our babies? And uh, uh, I just talked about the comp some of the complexities of the uh, microbial ecology of the GI tract. And here we are, over the last 10 years, we're taking microbes um, from various uh, uh, sources and uh, placing them into our babies and studying them uh, to see if there's a, a difference in sepsis, uh, if there's a difference in uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, et cetera. And I think that uh, there's some very interesting work that's been done in this area, but I think we need to uh, get a much better feel for these studies uh, before we make any de decisions on what to do with our, with our babies. Very recently, in the uh, uh, May issue of Pediatrics, there was a meta-analysis where 11 studies were evaluated. They looked at the risk for necrotizing enterocolitis and death and found that it was significantly lower in a probiotic group. Sepsis in this meta-analysis did not differ. The overall evidence indicated that additional, at least this is, okay, I put this in quotes because this is the discussion section of the paper. Overall evidence indicate that additional placebo-controlled trials are unnecessary if a suitable probiotic product is available. Okay. You don't see that very often in meta-analyses where they say no further studies are needed. We've got the answer. That's what they're saying here. We've got the answer. Don't need to look at it anymore. Okay. There was an accompanying commentary about the meta-analysis that said, why is there still reservation about adopting probiotics, where probiotics are licensed or available by special access schemes? We recommend that parents of all infants who meet eligibility criteria from an earlier trial be offered probiotics. Knowing what we know, do we have the right to deny parents the option? In fact, they implied that it was unethical not to give probiotics to preterm babies. There was another commentary by one of the editors of the journal, by Dr. Roger Sowell, and he said the 11 studies evaluated were mostly more mature than the infants at the greatest risk for necrotizing enterocolitis. The analysis provides few data from randomized controlled trials to address the effects in this highest risk population. Very importantly, and I think that this is probably one of the most important points in this study, at least 10 different probiotic agents were used in these 11 studies, okay? So can you imagine taking 10 different drugs, putting them together into a meta-analysis and evaluating 10 different drugs? Not every probiotic is the same. Not every probiotic has the same function. Okay, that's been clearly shown by many studies. But that's what they're doing in this meta-analysis. And Dr. Saul also says that meta-analyses have led us astray before and should not be overinterpreted. I want to just point out some misadventures that we've had in neonatal intensive care. We have uh, been very exuberant in doing certain things and jumping on the bandwagon and certain, uh, certain things. High oxygen, minimal oxygen, retinopathy, increased mortality, very well known uh, uh, misadventure in neonatal intensive care. High dose vitamin K and crinicterus, sulfazoxazole prophylaxis and crinicterus, chloramphenicol, cardiovascular collapse, steroids and cerebral palsy furosemide and pathologic fractures, all misadventures. We 
where we got really excited about a new therapy and we started using this without having the kind of evidence that was necessary uh, to, uh, to, to, to base that therapy. Well, let's look a little bit closer at at least one of the studies here. This is one of the largest studies, and this was done in Taiwan by Dr. Lin and colleagues. And this was a study that was done after they did an initial single center study uh, in Taiwan. And the single center study really showed uh, a marked increase in, uh, 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 I'm sorry, a marked decrease in death and necrotizing enterocolitis in their first study, okay? And that really caused a lot of excitement about a decrease in death. But did they ever report what caused the death in those babies? If you look at the entire meta-analysis and look at the studies, they never, in any of the studies, said what caused the death in those babies. A very recent study that was done in Brazil was stopped very early. And they found that four babies in the probiotic group died and zero babies in the control group died. Then they opened the, uh, the study and they found out that, those, that the deaths actually occurred before any of the babies were even given probiotics. Okay, so it's very important to consider why those babies died. But this is their second study, the second study from Taiwan, which is a multi-center trial looking at a lot of babies. The first trial suggested less sepsis. Then they changed their preparation just a little bit because their first preparation was not available. Here is overall sepsis. You look at gram negative and gram positive, the incidence of sepsis was actually a little bit higher in the study group, 40 versus 24. Then when you look at the sepsis in the babies less than 750 grams, here is the study group, the probiotic group, here's the control group, sepsis gram positive and gram negative, 12 babies had sepsis in the probiotic group, one baby had sepsis in the control group. Another interesting finding, PBL and IVH, nine babies with PBL or IVH, zero babies in the control group. Okay? Uh, secondary analysis, you know, they, looking back and uh, seeing these, these findings. But I think that this needs to uh, uh, raise a little bit of an alarm. Okay? So I just want to uh, uh, give you the message that uh, uh, we need to be very careful and proceed very carefully with the use of probiotics. Uh, I think that there are many units that have started to, to use these routinely based on some of these studies, but uh, I think a lot of the people have not looked very closely at these results and critically analyzed these results. Uh, there are some studies that are being done now, and I, I, I think that uh, we are probably going to hear the results of a couple of very large trials. Uh, one is coming from Australia. They have about 1,000 patients enrolled in the study in Australia. Another study that's coming out of Great Britain where they have uh, close to 1,000 babies enrolled. And there's another study that is just starting in the United States that is supposed to be a very large study of probiotics and necrotizing enterocolitis. We don't know what probiotic to use. I've seen situations where parents have gone to the physicians and said, we want you to use probiotics based on some of this. They, they, they have access to the internet. And so the physician uses any probiotic that is available to them. And I can tell you that a lot of the probiotics that I've seen used in the United States are not even on that list of 11 probiotics in these studies. Okay, so just some interesting things to take away here. Are there alternatives to live probiotic microbes? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about pre- and postbiotics. Uh, there's some work that's been done in several laboratories looking at inactivated uh, microbes, heat-inactivated microbes or UV inactivated microbes. We've done some work in our laboratory, and I'm not going to show you the details of this, but both in cell culture and in animals, we find that killed probiotics, killed probiotic microbes can actually have uh, 
modulating effect on the inflammatory response in the gastrointestinal tract. And some of the uh, uh, work that I showed you before, uh, the study that was uh, done in cell and uh, uh, that, that I gave you all the information about with uh, the LPS and toll-like receptor suggests that you can actually modulate the inflammatory response using some components of microbes, okay? So that's another new area. A few years ago, I happened to be uh, in Dubai, and I gave a lecture in Dubai on necrotizing intercolitis. And uh, after the lecture, uh, I talked to some people uh, who uh, told me that they were doing a study with uh, LGG, giving LGG to their babies in their neonatal intensive care unit. These people were from Egypt. And uh, uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus, it's a type of a probiotic, okay? <laughs> Uh, they're probably one of the more commonly used uh, probiotics. And so they were doing a study on necrotizing enterocolitis. And uh, uh, I mentioned to them that, you know, there's so many studies on necrotizing enterocolitis, and I, I, I told them about the studies that we were doing on killed probiotics. So they actually found out a, a little bit over a year later that they added a third arm to their study, even though they had this uh, randomized control uh, trial going on with live LGG versus no LGG, they added a therm, third arm where they heat killed LGG, the probiotic. And so they had in their final study, I found out a year later at a different conference that they had actually done this study. Uh, and they found that with a killed LGG, they also could decrease necrotizing enterocolitis. It was a very underpowered study. It wasn't uh, that well done, and it was, uh, the, I think that they tried to get it published in a couple of the more mainstream journals. They did finally get it published in the Journal of Pakistani Medicine, um, which, you know, I, I don't read very often, but uh, they, they did get this published, and it's a very interesting finding that killed probiotics may actually have an effect. Okay, what is a prebiotic? Well, it's a non-digestible food ingredient that can stimulate the growth or activity of bacteria in the digestive system which are beneficial to the health of the body. And typically, prebiotics are uh, carbohydrates such as uh, oligosaccharides, and they're usually derived uh, from plants. We give these prebiotics and uh, 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 I think that there have been some studies looking at uh, some of the positive effects of the prebiotics, but the positive effects in general have been looser stools, uh, lower pH of the stools. Um, there are some things that one would consider to be uh, positive effects. Babies don't seem to have as much constipation. But there is the potential that if you have bad bugs growing in the gastrointestinal tract, and if you put in prebiotics, that you can promote the growth of those bad bugs. There's a study from uh, Nantes, France, looking in an uh, animal model, showing that prebiotics actually result in greater bacterial translocation. We don't have many studies on the long-term effects of the prebiotics. So as far as the premature baby, they may enhance the growth of uh, the bad bacteria already present in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, and uh, the health, promo if health promoting species are not present to begin with, the prebiotic is unlikely to be effective. And this is one of the bases for the use of what is called symbiotics. Symbiotics is putting a probiotic together with a prebiotic. And there are some studies that are there are some studies being done to look at a symbiotic approach. I mentioned that uh, the pre, the, these prebiotics can result in di differences in bacterial fermentation. Well, one thing to remember, and I brought this up in the first lecture that I gave you, lactose may be considered a prebiotic because it does some of the same things as some of these other carbohydrates do. It increases the production of butyrate, acetate, lactate. This is just a, a study looking at uh, uh, intestinal epithelial cells placed on a, uh, a, a filter. This is a, what's called a transwell uh, membrane. 
uh, transwell apparatus, and you have uh, electrodes placed on the top and on the bottom. And as these cells get tighter, you have increased transepithelial resistance. And here we have butyrate versus controls over a period of uh, time using this system. You can tell that butyrate actually increases the tightness of junctions between epithelial cells. And that is one of the products of prebiotics or bacterial uh, um, um, fermentation. One study has looked at different concentrations of butyrate, very nice increase in uh, transepithelial resistance up to about 4 millimolar. An 8 millimolar absolutely kills the cells. So you have to be very careful. And it's been thought that butyrate could be used as something called a postbiotic. The term has been coined postbiotic, where this is the result of bacterial fermentation that you can actually use some of these results of bacterial fermentation to improve the, uh, the integrity of the bowel. Uh, but I think we also have to be very careful in that area. Okay, so take home message with the probiotics. And this is from a paper that uh, uh, Dr. Alan Walker and I wrote. Uh, there were several um, editorials that went back and forth. And uh, this was uh, 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 a quote from us, we continue to fully agree with a committee on nutrition from both Europe and America who have urged caution and additional confirmatory studies before a change in practice to include the routine use of probiotics to prevent necrotizing in the neonatal intensive care unit setting. Okay, so th what this is saying, both the American Academy of Pediatrics and ESPAGAN have recommended caution, okay, the major societies in our places, in our, in our continents that uh, uh, are the experts are recommending caution. As suggested in our review, before routine probiotic prophylaxis can be recommended to the neonatologists, it is important to have additional evidence provided in support of efficacy as well as both short and long-term safety information related to a single agent or set of agents that is chosen for use. At this time, we have no long-term studies to look at uh, probiotics in the, the use of uh, preterm babies, okay? So you want to just take a little rest, a couple minutes, because uh, uh, I still have a, a about 20 slides for uh, other areas. You want just, or you want me to keep on going? Keep going? Okay, I'll keep going. So. Immunonutrients, amino acids, glutamine and arginine. Uh, I have a very strong interest in uh, glutamine. I've, I've spent around uh, uh, 12 years of my career looking at uh, uh, studies related to glutamine, a lot of animal studies, a lot of studies in cell culture, and also some uh, studies in humans. Um, why is glutamine so exciting? Well, it is a, uh, considered to be a non-essential but actually conditionally essential amino acid, okay? I can't really call it truly essential or non-essential. It's conditionally essential. It becomes, uh, it's conditionally essential because under times of stress, uh, the concentration of glutamine will start to decrease in certain tissues such as muscles. So patients in intensive care units the glutamine concentration in their tissues have been measured, and they decrease markedly during times of stress. Adults, uh, very few, st uh, there, there's not, uh, we have not done muscle biopsy studies in babies, but if it happens in adults, in babies, it's very, very likely to happen also. Many studies in animals that show that glutamine depletion uh, is very common in critically ill uh, patients. Hans Krebs, of the Krebs cycle, who you're all familiar with, uh, called glutamine the most, uh, the most versatile of the amino acids. Here you can see where glutamine, glutamine is very versatile. It undergoes a lot of biochemical interactions. Glutamine can be converted to other amino acids. It is a precursor to nucleotides. The amide nitrogen, there are two nitrogen 
components to glutamine. The amide nitrogen is involved in making nucleotides, so very important for DNA synthesis, important for amino sugars and glycoprotein. These are important components of the mucus that line the gastrointestinal tract. Um, glutamine, when it gets deamidated, turns into glutamate, and glutamate is important in uh, neurotransmission as GABA. There are three amino acids that make up glutathione, glycine, cysteine, and what's the other one? Histine. No, 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 no. Glutamate. Glutamate is the third amino acid. Three amino acids that make up uh, glutathione, glutamate, glycine, and cysteine important for the production of folate. So you can see that uh, uh, the glutamate also can go into the TCA cycle as alpha-ketoglutarate and fill the TCA cycle uh, uh, and provide a process that's called anaplerosis, okay? The anaplerosis is filling of that cycle and so that you don't have to use as much glucose. Glutamine is thought to be one of the two major substrates for small intestinal epithelial cells very important uh, energy substrate for small intestinal epithelial cells, and also a very important substrate for lymphocytes. So what was the rationale? I'm, I'm skipping through this fairly rapidly here, but there's a lot of uh, uh, work that's been done in uh, um, uh, animals and a, a lot of work that has been done that uh, really supports the uh, uh, potential importance for glutamine in our premature babies. One of the first is glutamine is taken up by the fetus more than any other amino acid, and this is suddenly interrupted by premature birth. That is actually work that was done by Dr. Uh, Fred Vitaglia and uh, people working uh, with Dr. Hay several years ago uh, at the University of Colorado. Studies in animal models and critically ill human adults demonstrate a beneficial effect of glutamine during critical illness and experimental models of intestinal damage. In other words, if you take an animal and if you give that animal uh, either irradiation to the abdomen or if you give that animal uh, chemotherapy, cancer type of chemotherapy, if you pretreat that animal with glutamine, you save the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the premature human neonate is highly susceptible to intestinal damage and sepsis, very high incidence of late onset sepsis in many neonatal intensive care units. Okay, so why not use glutamine in premature neonates? Well, some people consider it to be non-essential. What kind of amino acid is glutamine? Conditionally essential. It's not essential. It's not truly non-essential. It is conditionally essential. It's unstable in aqueous solutions. So in other words, if you take glutamine, put it into water, and shake it up, and uh, uh, put it into, the, uh, 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 into room temperature, in a week, if you measure glutamine and some of the other uh, components, you will find something called pyroglutamate, which is potentially toxic. And this is one of the reasons why the companies that make the amino acids have not added glutamine to solutions. And in the past, there have been a lack of studies of glutamine supplementation. We did one of the first studies of glutamine supplementation in preterm babies, and we used enteral glutamine supplementation. And this was uh, reported in the Journal of Pediatrics in 1997. And what we saw in this small study, 68 babies, Okay, we saw a decrease in hospital-acquired sepsis. We saw a decreased activation of certain T cell subsets, which suggested less bacterial translocation. We saw decreased cost of hospitalization, improved tolerance to enteral feedings, and we also thought that it was safe when we mixed it fresh daily. Okay, so what we did with this, we mixed it fresh daily and added it to the baby's milk mother's milk or to the formula that the baby was getting, okay? Well, that initially uh, uh, caused maybe a little bit of enthusiasm, but the fact that there were so many other studies coming out uh, in animals and in adults showing benefits of glutamine, uh, the uh, National Institutes of Health finally got uh, uh, very interested in, uh, in studying this further. 
and another group, a private group, Pediatrics, came along a little bit later to study this. Ne NIH Neonatal Network, just to refresh your memory, uh, is a uh, uh, neonatal network of about 15 neonatal ICUs in the U.S. Dr. Bell is very much involved with the uh, uh, neonatal network. And um, uh, we, uh, uh, the uh, network decided to do a study uh, on uh, glutamine supplementation, but it was intravenous glutamine supplementation, different than the study that we did. Ours was enteral glutamine supplementation, okay? Let me just show you a little bit about the uh, uh, results. I, I don't have the, I do have the results here. Yes, this is the, uh, um, no, that, that, that's a different result, okay? Let me go. Okay, I, I'm not going to show you the exact results from the uh, uh, NIH neonatal network trial, but I'm going to tell you what those results were, R really simply. They found nothing, yeah, no difference. No. 14, 33 babies, they found no differences with glutamine supplementation versus the controls. But one of the things that they did that was very interesting in this study, and maybe I say maybe a major flaw was that the, in the glutamine supplemented group, they took glutamine and added it to 20, as 20 percent glutamine in the entire amino acid solution, but they took out 20 percent of the other amino acids, including the essential amino acids. And the reason they did this was so that the glutamine supplemented group would be isonitrogenous so that you would be getting as much nitrogen in the glutamine supplemented group as in the control group. So the glutamine supplemented group was a glutamine supplemented group, but also a group that had a deprivation of other amino acids, including some of the essential amino acids, okay? So that may be one of the uh, a flaw in that study. The other study that was done was the enteral glutamine supplementation trial, and this was done by this private group called Pediatrics, and this was done by giving enteral glutamine through the GI tract, okay? But it was, again, different. I uh, was involved in uh, uh, helping the, uh, the, these uh, people design the trial, and there was a lot of controversy at the beginning of the study because it, was, it would be very complicated for 20 different neonatal intensive care units to learn how to mix the glutamine in very small quantities with the formula or with the human milk. They thought that that was very, very complicated. So we decided on an alter alternative way to do this, to let the neonatologists feed the baby however they wanted, but to have certain guidelines that we wanted to reach cer a certain level of feedings by one week and two weeks but that we would give the glutamine in water, okay? So we gave the glutamine as a supplement in water to those babies. So the amount of glutamine that was given was 0.3 grams per kilo per day for the first 30 days of life. The reason the 0.3 was chosen, why do you think we chose 0.3 as a dosage? Well, if you, or need to get three grams per kilo per day of uh, amino acid or protein, what is the percentage of uh, glutamine in that protein matrix? It's 10 percent. 10 percent is 0.3 grams. That's the rationale for using the 0.3 grams in that study. So that study was done, and here is the major outcome, sepsis no difference. Very disappointing, okay? No difference. But that's what happened. So, <laughs> uh, should we really uh, be considering that uh, glutamine is dead and should it rest in peace? Well, I, I, I think that there's still, uh, we still have a lot to learn and that there were some problems with some of these studies. There are at least 
Two other small studies, one from uh, uh, Holland, from Amsterdam. Uh, there's another one from Turkey, and I think that there's, there's probably a few more. Uh, you mentioned one the other day uh, uh, that are looking at glutamine supplementation, smaller studies where they saw some benefits. So I think that there certainly um, is still some interest in this area, but these are two big studies that really have dampened our interest. But let's look back at the enteral glutamine supplementation trial. There were some secondary outcomes that are of interest. If you look at gastrointestinal dysfunction, in other words, feeding tolerance, the glutamine supplemented group had better feeding tolerance than the control group. And one other area that was of interest, and this is, look again, a secondary analysis, and I don't know exactly how to explain this, uh, but as Dr. Martin was talking about the other day, certain nutrients, certain nutrients can be anti-inflammatory. And we have a lot of evidence in our cell culture work and also in our animal culture work that glutamine can also be anti-inflammatory. Well, what did we see with uh, uh, periventricular hemorrhage and uh, periventricular leukomalacia? There was a decrease in the glutamine supplemented group on secondary analysis. Again, I don't know if that's real or not, but we did see that in our data. Okay, so that's glutamine. Arginine, another amino acid, also condi considered conditionally essential, just like glutamine. But it's considered conditionally essential in adults, but essential in young, growing mammals. It's known to be important for immune stimulation Nitric oxide uh, synthase uh, is, uh, is the enzyme for which it's a substrate, and it also increases growth hormone production. A lot of interesting information coming out uh, uh, about arginine and neonates. The plasma concentrations are decreased at the time of diagnosis in necrotizing enterocolitis. Low plasma arginine is also associated with the severity of respiratory distress syndrome. There have been some studies looking at arginine supplementation in uh, babies with uh, pulmonary hypertension, which has suggested some benefits. There's one study that was uh, done in Canada by Dr. Amin and colleagues with 152 premature babies weighing less than 1,250 grams, giving them 1.5, this is millimoles per kilo per day, supplemented either enterally or intravenously. They found no problems with safety and a decrease in NEC. Now, this decrease in NEC that you see here, the point zero zero one, included stage one babies, okay? So maybe one of the things that they were seeing is something that was not truly NEC. But when they just looked at the stage two and three, it was also very close to statistical significance. So this is a, a very interesting finding, but nobody has repeated that study since that time. Who's this? Stevie Wonder. Okay. He's wearing sunglasses, right? Why is he wearing sunglasses? Is he trying to be cool? He's blind. Okay. Why is he blind? He was a premature and had retinopathy of prematurity. He was born in the uh, early 1950s. Hmm? He has metabolic Oh, he might. <laughs> he might. But that's not what I want to talk about. <laughs> uh, this is also a baby with the uh, classic retrolental fibroplasia. That's what they used to call it in the old days, where you had the retina detached and you saw this uh, uh, white looking uh, 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 eye over here. Okay, that's uh, retina of the premature. Why do I bring this up? Well, we're talking about glutamine and arginine, okay? About, uh, it's close to nine years now, I went to a, a meeting, an experimental biology meeting, and I ran into a colleague who uh, I used to work with, uh, Steve Abkauer, who was in New Mexico. He's a biochemist. And Steve was working with uh, retinal epithelial cells. And one of the things he told me about this work that he was doing in retinal epithelial cells was that when he took glutamine out of the culture media, the retinal epithelial cells had a marked increase 
in something called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, okay? Marked increase, eight-fold increase in VEGF. They also saw an increase in VEGF production when they took arginine out of the uh, uh, culture media, but not as great as with glutamine. So that gave us uh, an idea that uh, perhaps we could start to look at this uh, uh, glutamine in retinopathy of prematurity. But at the time that I was talking to Steve about this, we were actually developing something different. We decided to develop something called a dipeptide of arginine and glutamine. Uh, in Europe, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Dr. Peter Steele developed a dipeptide of alanine and glutamine. But we thought that it would be interesting to actually develop a dipeptide of arginine and glutamine because the arginine has some of the effects that I just talked to you about. It's conditionally essential, and it may be very helpful for our premature babies. And also would be more stable in aqueous solutions and also be more soluble. So we thought about this with ROP. And let me just go through some of the mechanisms of ROP. You have uh, hyperoxia, vasoconstriction, poor blood flow and retinal ischemia, overproduction of vascular endothelial growth factor is a, a major component, and that leads to neovascularization. Okay. So the rationale, I think I just told you a little bit of the rationale, that VEGF is very important in the pathogenesis <coughs> of retinopathy. And Arginine also has this effect of vascular dilatation. So we actually went and uh, patented, uh, we have now three patents on this, and that's my disclosure. Uh, we have three patents on this, so uh, I may be a little bit biased in what I say, but you, you're going to hear it anyway. Uh, we did a study using uh, uh, Dr. Lois Smith's model of uh, retinopathy, uh, oxygen-induced retinopathy, and I'm working with uh, Dr. Maria Grant, who's a pharmacologist in our department with us. And what this involves, focus over here, is at around <coughs> seven days, we start baby mice on 75% oxygen exposure. Keep them in this oxygen environment, in uh, uh, these little chambers with their mothers for, uh, from day seven to day 12. Then we take them out. And over this period of time, this is very well documented, these baby animals start to develop oxygen-induced retinopathy. They have a lot of uh, proliferation of their blood vessels, and they also have a lot more angiogenesis. VEGF levels are very high in their retinas. This just shows you one of our treatments. And you can look this up in a, a paper that we published a few years ago. And this is with intraperitoneal arginyl glutamine supplementation vehicle. <coughs> This is the dipeptide. This looks much more normal than this. This is uh, uh, this tufting that you see here is very pathological. Okay. We decided to look at other organs in these animals. Here's the lung, and uh, this is on day 17 when you see the uh, oxygen-induced retinopathy. This is uh, uh, in air-exposed animals. This is what the lung looks like. This is the uh, uh, kind of lung that we see with hyperoxia. This is with arginyl glutamine. And we also did a study looking at DHA. And we see that DHA also seems to improve this situation, but maybe not as much as the dipeptide. Looking at the intestinal tract, this is the control. This is the hyperoxia. We actually see damage to the intestine with hyperoxia. This is surprising to us. But with arginyl glutamine and DHA, we see a protective effect. So to conclude with the arginyl glutamine dipeptide, entrally, uh, that last study was enteral glutamine supplementation, uh, arginyl glutamine supplementation. It restored the uh, areas of uh, uh, central basal obliteration, uh, actually reduced some of the uh, effects of the oxygen-induced toxicity, and uh, it also seemed to have some protective effects in the uh, lung and in the intestine. So I'd like to end this lecture with, uh, some summary, with a summary and take-home messages. Uh, the intestinal microbial environment during early life may have a major influence in subsequent health and disease. We're just beginning to learn about this, and we have a lot of challenges. We have a lot to learn about probiotics before we consider using them uh, uh, routinely. Further take-home messages, the gut is an immune organ that needs to be fed. 
So just enteral nutrition is very important. But there may be some conditionally essential nutrients, and Cami was talking about them, some of them. And I think that one of them that we have to give a lot of attention to is the omega-3 fatty acids, not necessarily providing them as a nutrient for the body, but providing them as a uh, topical nutrient for the developing gastrointestinal tract. So we need to optimize some of these individual nutrients in these babies also. So we still have a lot to learn in those areas. Thank you for your attention. I can answer some questions, specific questions to this lecture now, but then we'll also have a little panel discussion. I would like to come to this slide that you showed with the mothers uh, who had uh, delivered either with cesarean section or a vaginal delivery, and um, the microbes were, uh, if the baby was born vaginally, was uh, the microbes were uh, more similar to the vaginal, the vaginal the microbes, and yes. if the if there was by cesarean section, they were more likely like the skin of the mother. Is it actually? that they were likely with the skin of the mother because these were nosocomial uh, microbes which the mother took on her skin and also the baby had taken because I cannot understand if the baby is born by cesarean section why the microbes would uh, be like the mother's skin, not only through the environment. Yeah, I yeah. I, I think that uh, uh, when the baby uh, gets close to the mother, is being held by the mother, uh, after a cesarean section, there's a mixture of the microbes uh, between the baby and the mother. If the, ba if the baby is breastfeeding, uh, the baby may be getting some of the, uh, the microbes from the mother's skin, um, and th that may be reflected in the gastrointestinal but tract. These were not meconium samples. These were samples from later on. But the baby that is vaginally delivered is also held by the mother immediately after. Yeah, but we, th they saw the vaginal microflora in the babies who were delivered by the, and the vaginal microflora is different than the skin microflora. I think that's, that's become clear, that there's a, a lot of differences between vaginal microflora versus okay. skin microflora. And the skin microf microflora has nothing to do with the environment? I mean, with the nosocomial? Uh, oh, of course, uh, of course, of course. Yeah. It, uh, I, uh, whatever is, say, uh, yeah. yeah. So it may not why. necessarily, I think, uh, I, now I understand what you're saying. Yeah. It may not necessarily be directly from the mother, but what the mother is exposed to yeah. is the same thing the that same the baby thing is exposed the baby. to. Yeah. That's, I think yeah. that's yeah. the most uh, yeah. reasonable explanation yes. sure. of that. Sure, sure. And uh, then when you mentioned about the, ba the um, rats or mice, I don't know what it, it was, that had problems, uh, psychological problems, uh, uh -huh. born by cesarean section, or um, not psychological, I don't remember what it was, yeah. but it had something to do with uh, Okay, well, not by cesarean section, okay. The, the, let me just repeat that a little bit. I, I, I went through that fairly quickly. I know I gave you a lot of material here. But the, the, the point there was that uh, those, baby, the, the, those uh, infant animals who were born in a germ-free environment, kept in chambers that had no microbes, and if you kept them into, you know, in these chambers and as adults, uh, they had a different behavior than animals who were also kept in chambers but were allowed to be, have access to microbes. Okay. Okay. And so there was a difference in anxiety yeah. in adulthood in those, uh, in those animals. Whether we can extrapolate this to the, to the baby that is born by cesarean section which comes from, a, from who comes from a sterile environment in, uh, versus the baby who comes from an uh, environment as the vagina, which is full of microbes, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, by now we know that uh, babies that are born uh, by cesarean section, they have later on in life, beside all other things that you mentioned, allergies and so on, they have more cancers, and they have more schizophrenia and uh, oh, really? more, I yes, I know that. Mm -hmm. more, um, more, more this uh, psychiatric diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is actually, they, they say that uh, what, what is uh, due to is epigenetics. Mm -hmm. 
that these microbes, the, the, the delivery sure. through cesarean section does not cause catecholamines and also does not uh, uh, causes the stress of uh, delivery is very essential sure. in order to, uh, to make this, uh, um, to keep this baby uh, sure. uh, normal while mm -hmm. the non-stress causes epigenetic uh, disorders which later are responsible for uh, uh, for these uh, psychiatric diseases. Yeah, and I think that that's really fascinating that you bring up the epigenetic part of this because, as I mentioned, you know, the uh, bioreactor role of the microbes, one of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, molecules that are a product of this bioreactor role are acetate, propionate, butyrate. Those are major epigenetic mediators. Acetylation of histone is very important. Acetylation of histone helps unravel the histone so that there is more DNA available for interaction with the uh, 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 transducing factors. 